I've been, I've been elected to introduce people, uh, which seems good enough, and, and to chair the meeting. Just a brief introduction, because uh, we want to get into the slides. I mean, I, I've known Peter, I don't know, 20 years? Doesn't seem a <laughs> day <laughs> too hard. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess the... I'm trying to think of a way of uh, describing Peter. I think the most amazing, the thing that amazes me 20 years later is that uh, there's a man who has uh, amazing enthusiasm and absolutely extraordinary energy. If I tell you that uh, I met him in the AA bar Friday evening, he just got off an aeroplane from Oslo, I think. Um, and came to a lecture at the AA with his cases in his hand. And I think this is the seventh lecture in 14 days, yes? <laughs> uh, this is apart from writing things uh, and drawing things, as you know. Uh, so this extraordinary energy is, uh, uh, needs to be seen to be believed, and, and I'm no slouch. Um, I think the other thing is that uh, he injects into the system uh, the, the architectural world uh, objects, uh, ideas, uh, um, uh, and the like that annoy. And uh, I mean, we always used to have a, a saying that, that that will annoy them. Um, whoever them was, and uh, I think Peter still keeps that going. Um, I think the, 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 one of the problems with the architectural world is that we're incredibly complacent and incredibly boring as, as a, a group, as a whole. I don't mean this group here. And I think that Peter adds into the system this little annoyance, and I, I'm sure he's going to annoy a few people this evening. <laughs> I hope to do it elegantly. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very aware this evening of being in a sort of special building done by uh, an architect who's sitting here and being amongst a whole lot of people. I mean, almost everybody in this room, that's everybody except about two or three people here, who actually build and who've actually built quite a lot. And I say this as a as a kind of uh, preliminary to the main bit of talking with, with pictures, which is inevitably talking with pictures which are drawn. There is not a single built building. There is, I think, one picture or maybe two pictures of a building that we hope is about to be built. Uh, and even then, they are the competition drawings and model. So that one comes as a, as a kind of fraud, in a way, because I do actually think, and we've just been having two minutes around on the subject of an exhibition of architectural drawings, which is happening elsewhere in this town. And I, in fact, you know, a major part of my income in the last two or three years has come from this sale of architectural drawings. And the method of one's, of one's business of irritating them, if that is what it is, has been by way of drawings. And I say this before talking through drawings because I think that um, the thing that does irritate me about architecture is that all of us uh, find it comfortable to operate within a prescribed territory. We all find it comfortable to operate and comment within a prescribed territory. So we say, oh yes, that guy, he, you know, he may be pretty dumb, but he builds. Or they say, that guy, you know, he can't, he can't know about building because he draws. Or that guy, you know, he's, he, he teaches, but, you know, I bet he couldn't put his hand on a pencil, etc., etc. And all the time that I have been teaching, which is now 16 years, and drawing, which is a little bit longer, uh, I have actually continued to feel that what I should be doing is building. Uh, albeit that I think in this country we have more bad buildings done for the right reason than almost any other country I've, I've experienced. And I say that deliberately in this company. I think the more 
sort of pious words and absolutely crass uh, end results. I, I don't think you'd find a place where this happens. There are other places where there are even more crass results, but at least they don't have to chat to back them up. Uh, and, and of course, the, the opposite is true. And I really feel that. So that in the end, um, facing you guys who build and, 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 and who, many of you whose work I admire, I thought, what the hell can I talk about? Most of them, have, most of the stuff gets published, and, and I think that you are amongst the people who build, who probably do read magazines more than. So, what the hell do you talk about? Then it occurred to me that the thing, actually, to to try and expose to you is the fact that that most of these drawings and projects um, are actually concerned with an architectural. Um, debate with themselves. They're actually concerned with an architectural operation, an architectural manoeuvre. And I think that, that Alison Smithson sitting here, and I, I should mention the fact that when I was a very young student, even in Bournemouth, before I ever came to the A, I used to see these absurdities that came out of the Smithsons and were done in strange London art galleries and things. And they were often ideas accompanied by a strange scribble. Some sort of scribble would say that, that such and such is a cluster or such and such is a infrastructure or something. I didn't even know what these things meant, but, but I, was, I was inspired by the audacity of the statement and then subsequently intrigued by the audacity of the object. And I think that without the example of the Smithsons, the whole business of the English audacious project and the English audacious drawing could could not have happened. I think it would have been much more difficult. Uh, I think there is an essential link between most of the English projects, and I don't just mean my own, I mean Ron's projects and those of some of our uh, students and, and so on, um, have a curious relationship to building technique or real sizes of objects. I can remember in the very early days when we were drawing things like Ron's Walking City or, or Plug-in City, in my case, that the thing people used to say, oh, it looks ra rather like this things in France being done by, you know, Maimon or Biro or all these sort of French arms in the air people. The difference was that, that, that really irritated me was that, that Maimon's things were always amazing gestures, but you could never actually scale them. I was always very irritated by the fact when you look closely at them, the, the bits of stick that held them up <coughs> were... were were pencil dashes, you know, almost dashed off pencil lines. And when you look closely at them, they were, you know, they, they, they were there to impress. They weren't there to be fabricated. And I, I, I think that um, it has always intrigued me that I find it mus myself very difficult to do even the hairiest gestural drawing without actually deciding on the scale of it and the matrix from which it might depart. And so that's actually my theme this evening is is rules and the interest that I have had in breaking them. Um, and I'll start off with a very old project. And really, I think the project, it's a 1972 project, so it's not quite 10 years ago. Um, it is still, in fact, a project which I think, for me, marks a major shift from the earlier work of Plug and City and all of that, and, and, the, and the earlier work which was to do with um, dismantling the Plug in City and things like it, the, the instant villages and the things that went bang in the night and the inflatables and so on. But the, the urban mark was a very necessary project in order to have a firm basis upon which to hang some preposterous and audacious notions. And in order to do that, and it, it demonstrates this preoccupation which I still have, of setting up a system and then eating it away, destroying it, playing with it, <coughs> converting it, making fun of it even. And the primitiveness of the, of the diagram um, and I'm sure all of you know this project, so I won't go into great detail about it, but the primitiveness of the diagram is very necessary 
in order, first of all, to load it in as hot a manner as I could think of at the time. I mean, if I were to redo this project, which I easily could at the moment, the, the actual objects would be slightly different in form, would probably be more, I hope, slightly more literate in imagery and probably more different one from the other. They were certainly, of course, more different one from the other than they might have been uh, eight years before that, which was actually the date of Plugin City. If you take it roughly as an equal distance of time from Plugin City to this and from this to now, um, Plugin City looked very much like itself. All the bits that were plugged in were, were similarly styled or drawn. Uh, and therefore, in my view now, uh, had much less inherent dynamic, if you forget the cranes and the things going bang in the night, than, than did this, which demanded to be polyglot. It demanded to, to prove that it could contain, at the first stage, a whole range of objects. Now, I can look back at it nine years later and say, my God, it's still very narrow-minded. It was still concerned with loopy shapes and clickety-click objects and, and the range if at one end of the range <coughs> was a sort of prefabricated room unit and at the other end of the range was a sort of bell tent, uh, that is still, from where I sit now, a fairly narrow range of territory. Nonetheless, it was important to demonstrate that, first of all, the simple engineering armature could take almost anything. And then the process and the storyline, as you may know, is, was a process of disintegration, but was also a process of mixing, a process of introducing the irreverent as well as the irrelevant. The, the process of, for instance, introducing silly objects, uh, deliberately silly objects, strange objects, vegetable objects. I found it extremely difficult because I too had had, you know, six years of expensive architectural education and one had not been trained to draw, to design or to place or to even consider uh, badly placed and ill-designed objects. One even started having art worry about whether that door should be in the middle of the side of that stupid box. Um, and I think some of the fight, if, if Ron has described it as, as upsetting them, part of the a priori conversation with myself has been, to, how can you upset yourself? How can you start attacking uh, some kind of architectural object in a way that actually disturbs you? Because usually all of us keep what we do within comfortable limits. We keep the rules, even if they're looking picturesque, even if they're looking strange. The kind of strangeness is a kind of strangeness that we like. And if I were to now criticize the final object here <coughs> on the left, forgetting the storyline of, you know, that the, the city disintegrates into something which is um, ambiguous, is it the end of the civilization, or is it the, is it the most sophisticated architecture, etc.? I have to admit at another level that I end up with an object which suited my, um, my sort of painter's instinct, if I dare call it that, at that time. And so I would now criticize it for still being too sweet, still being too complete, still being consistent with itself. Nonetheless, I think the, the project was was quite important for me. It, it was sufficiently tough as, a, as a, an armature, and sufficiently tough as a program, because one didn't know where it would, when one started the drawing, series of drawings, one didn't know where it would lead. One knew the thing would disintegrate. One didn't know quite how or what it would look like. I would criticize it now for still being too consistent with itself until too sweet, it's still too sweet, but it did, clear the decks. And I think that if you are this kind of drawer architect, uh, by, by default, in fact, then you start to develop a, an overview. You, you probably, and it's something to do with being a teacher as well, I mean, everything has to be post-rationalized. Everything has to be explained so at least 20 other people can get the, at least the sniff of what it's about. 
And you start to actually do that with yourself. You can't, you know, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for teachers to draw. Uh, and I can remember the first two years of teaching, a long time ago now, I actually did far less um, designing work than at any time since, be that as it may. Um, I think that you do see certain projects in a kind of strategic sense that, that for instance, the plug-in city and the instant city and the urban mark and the Arcadia thing served a very definite purpose in order to congregate various little bits of ideas that had existed in other projects or competition schemes and so on in order to force certain ideas together. Um, and I'm sure that the process of making a building is, of course, the real one that should, should do this. The, the curious thing is this preoccupation with the armature. Uh, in this case, of course, and I'm jumping about this evening. I'm jump not going chronologically through. I'm just jumping about on, on the themes of the things from which one then parts company. The, the armature here is the same sort of armature as in the urban mark. It is a competition project, but it's that Shinkenshiku competition, which means that, that in effect, it's still uh, a free fall project. Uh, the armature is very deliberate and plays a game that by now, and we're, we're much further on in time, we're, we're about five years ago, instead of nine years ago. By this time, one is involved in symbolic games as well as purely organizational games. Um, and of course, it is designed with another person whose influence is there also. The armature again is used to demonstrate and to hold together the unlike with the unlike, the idea of very organized space. The arbor, although it's made up of vegetable parts, is in fact highly organized. And I like things like that. I like the notion of the, 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 the t most tight assed piece of the building actually being fabricated or actually being um, decorated, if you like, in the most uncontrollable substance. And the loosest part of the uh, organization, the grotto, is actually made of the hardest and most permanent elements. I like, I like those sort of ambiguities. I like the idea that the grotto too, which you just see here in section on the right, is in fact organized around an orthogonal piece of planning. Um, and it's other parts of the building which in fact are looser, but appear to be tighter when you see them in section. The, the intersecting cross is is very nice because it establishes the architectural occasion, but it has infinite freedom in, in the four directions. I, there wasn't any conscious there wasn't any conscious link between that and the Via Appia at the time. I think it's only easier to, to see the the irony of the two projects much later. Um, in the Arcadia city, which, as I've explained, is a, was a sort of portmanteau for a whole lot of little ideas, um, one again is playing this notion of setting up a very hard-assed element, almost a vicious element, and then seeing from that viciousness by which ways you can uh, erode it. The proposition here for this particular piece of the Arcadia City was a half mile long street which climbs up a hill and has a wall to the street which is absolutely straight um, and is faced in steel panels, in sheet steel panels. And these are the quite large sheet steel panels and the hill is running up there. Forget in a sense, although it, it looks maybe amusing or funny, forget the left-hand side of the drawing. I don't want to talk about that particularly, but what I want to talk about is the, the game played with this, this vicious street. The, the memory that, that suggested the street was an afternoon in Hamburg when it was very windy and one was sort of trapped in the center of a street trying to cross it. 
and there were these vicious, windy, hard uh, atmosphere. Uh, I think it's somewhere pitched between Hamburg and, and Chicago, if you, if you get the, the feel of that. Absolutely relentless, although the, the storyline for the buildings is, is the New York lofts. The storyline that behind the sheet steel panels are <coughs> a series of loft spaces that can be used for habitation, storage, etc., etc. Um, and having made that proposition, this relentless street, and ideally with, with a sort of Germanic tram running up and down it, uh, is the notion that then, having made it, there is something curious happening above it. But, but you can't, we're seeing now the, the, the full frontal elevation. In fact, if you were somewhere down at the pavement level, or in the middle of the street, you wouldn't see very much of that top stuff. Uh, you wouldn't see these strange little apartments and trees and scoops. You might, you might just see the lower end of them. And the storyline then is that as one moves up the half-mile street, the little romantic objects, which I think have English overtones, certainly in part, take over, that the erosion in upon the street, and as the hill meets it. Finally, the relentless object gives way, and, and the metal things turn into little cottages, virtually. And I was amused by that as a scenario. I was amused by this thing that seems to be invincible, having the seeds of, of a certain kind of, of uh, destruction, or a certain kind of, of antibody in it. And in fact, the same thing is happening in the plan as is happening as one proceeds up the hill. In fact, the back of that, this is the hard street running down here. The hard back of it, uh, sorry, the back of it is not hard. The front is hard. The back is eroded. And in fact, the whole uh, investigation there was a sort of rerun of the megastructure. But here it's a rerun, you know, 12, 14 years later. And the other thing that it amused me to do, because one is constantly surrounded by analyses of building by the method of the figure ground diagram, I was amused to see what would happen if I imposed upon my own plan, but afterwards, a figure ground <laughs> diagram. Because I, I'm, I'm very um, alien in the way that I design, I'm, I, I feel that the figure ground has nothing particularly to offer me. I think that it, it distills <coughs> architectural objects into static plus elements or static minus elements, and I just don't think it's as simple as that, certainly not if you're interested in, in slightly more dynamic architecture. Nonetheless, it amused me to do the exercise, and it also amused me that having done the exercise, it produces quite a pretty figure ground diagram. I mean, it's as good, or I think, as good or as bad as any other. It just doesn't really tell you what the thing is about, and I, I like, some, and again, I guess this is the sort of teacher coming up. One likes playing certain games which one knows almost beforehand are not going to to be very useful, but one is just intrigued to see what happens and whether it might might tell you something about yourself. Uh, I'm deliberately in the case of these Arcadia uh, things this evening, whereas I would normally, to, to a sort of general audience, I would normally reverse the process. I would normally introduce each part of the Arcadia city by saying, this is the segment of the city where these sorts of people live, and this is the long street, and this is this is what it looks like. And so now I'm deliberately this evening concerning myself for, you, for your benefit with this reiterative game, this reiterative instinct that one has about erecting a system and then eroding it. So, but, but just by the way, I will tell you that that particular piece of the city was intended for this sort of group of people who are sort of cartoon of the people that do live in New York lofts or might. Uh, the, the whole city plan itself, I would not repeat now, because I think it's, it's 
entirely artificial, but it, it suited the program of saying that if one uses this word Arcadia as a summary of a whole set of ideas about the, the lovely future, that in fact there are individual alternative lovely futures according to the kind of person that you are. Therefore the city is an agglomerate <coughs> of six or seven or eight alternative lovely futures and that these six or seven or eight alternatives find themselves coming together um, in segments of the town. And so uh, it is very artificial as a, as a study because I don't think that, that one necessarily wants it to be like that. The, the central object, the, the city hall, again is playing this, this game with itself of establishing something and then eroding it. But the, but the process is different here because um, it, it happens over the length of the building itself. At one end of the building, one has this almost, uh, again, almost a vicious object this oversized, uh, over-heroized object, the, the tower, which establishes it as the primary building in the town. It, 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 it's saying this is where the, the power is. It then has a secretariat as the city hall. It has a sec the secretariat part of the city hall, which again is the sort of largest, boldest, bl most bloody and resolute object. But the object itself then begins to disintegrate and the scenario is that within that building it changes from being large organizations to smaller and smaller and smaller until you turn the corner and the, the amoebic part of the building is in fact a, a sort of open marketplace with just little one-man cardboard box stalls in it. Very naive program, but I think one was trying to make a point about a building being able not only to metamorphose over its length, but also to be able to externalize the, the changes in its use while still having some, some continuity. I think, in fact, if I were to criticize it myself now in retrospect, there is such a major shift between this part of the building and that, I, I think if I were to re, redo it, I would make the, the transition even slower and more ambiguous. This business of, of having a hard element from which one can disintegrate, I try again in the uh, Arcadia city, in another part of the city, which was meant to be, and here's the, the cartoon with it, was meant to be a sort of sly dig at English academic life. Uh, and the sorts of people that, that uh, you know, do French cooking and collect wine and have naughty children and, and uh, paperback books on certain kind of shelving and so on. Um, it, it, it is meant to be a nostalgic quote for English provincial universities somehow or other, but, but it needed it needed this, this one single stone wall element upon which you hang the hangers and from which you then disintegrate. Again, it's, it's setting up rather hard elements and then allowing the very soft elements to disintegrate off them. Another, a different attempt. I, I couldn't find the plan. I did a, an awful pencil scrawl here, which I can't even see from where I'm sitting. This was meant to be the hospital element of the same city, where one basically establishes a, a central fin, and on the one side, the, the top in the plan, one has the main uh, operating <coughs> elements, and on the other side, one has the alternative ward elements and the again rather naive idea that the wards could be an offering of three types of hospital ward. On the one hand a sort of friendly arrangement of buildings, nostalgic buildings, buildings in which you would not feel uh, you would not feel frightened. In the middle territory a sort of quote of, of 
hospital building per se, a typical sort of hospital wing in a vaguely functionalist style and arranged in sensible wards and so on. And on the right hand side, um, a highly mechanized, pressurized architecture, if you felt that, that you know, the only way you'd really get better would be if ev every conceivable invention that, that was up to the moment was being used upon you, then you go into a building that looks like it. Again, a naive idea, but the thing that has remained in my mind is this notion of, of and it, it was so in the previous slide, this notion of establishing a kind of quasi-natural element. I think it's the kind of element that one gets in old harbour walls or ancient walls or pieces of structure for which the origin is so far back you can't really quantify it. And then allowing other pieces of building to attach to it. And that preoccupation does run through from that previous uh, slide to this. The notion of a structure which is quite a familiar kind of urban structure, particularly to, to English people, I think, the, the notion of the meandering path which then generates pieces of building. One again was perverting in this instance, um, one was suggesting that the territory between the, the buildings could be artificial, in the in, indicated in pink, a normal grass, bushes, etc., indicated in green. And a very strange kind of apartment organized there. Uh, once you have this plan, you have the proposition. And this was a sort of nostalgic trip, this particular alternative Arcadia. This, this was a trip back to the days of Archigram, the idea that a certain kind of city person, indicated on the right, would enjoy the facility of two bathrooms, would enjoy the facility of a high degree of, of servicing, would enjoy a very uh, packaged kind of kitchen, and a very small conservatory, because they certainly wouldn't want to mess around watering real plants. They might have plastic plants, as a suggestion. And might even tolerate the idea of a lot of light uh, albeit that the wall between them and the next apartment is actually a rather opaque glass wall. And I had another idea running at the back of my mind, which was what would happen if you made a building of apartments where natural light could actually permeate the whole of the building? And what were the possibilities of the, you know, glass bricks, I think, have been a great favorite of people like Ron and myself, and probably a lot of people sitting here. What are the actual potentialities of, of a translucent glass wall, um, which actually crops up in quite a lot of projects. If you, if you remember the Via Appia project, you notice that, that strange large chamber. The notion there, again, was to make a chamber where there would be a transition from total transparency through degrees of translucency and opacity to thick opacity, which would finally be ground, rather than having a window. Uh, and in a moment, I shall show you the Trondheim Library project, where again the notion is to present a, a wall that allows enough light to pass through that you can read the general profile of the internal buildings, but you can't actually see them in detail. Um, I'm digressing slightly, but it, it intrigues me at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated at the moment by the problem of windows, which might sound a naive thing to say, but I, I, I feel that people of my generation um, were at the sort of epicenter of, of the period when windows were a non-conversation. I think if I look back at nearly all the things I've ever drawn, I have s almost studiously avoided designing windows. I don't think we've ever talked about windows. Uh, one has tried to talk about solidity or transparency or translucency, about solid, about void, about certain atmospheres, about certain structures, about meshes and so on, but the actual placed window, the object through which you then permit uh, 
to see the, 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 the framed object. I, I personally find it extremely difficult. I, have, I still have a lot of art worry over windows, and most of these things, if you, if you look at them, avoid. I have a lot of window, or sort of none at all. But that's a, that's a slight uh, aside. I mean, one can take that, so that one can post-rationalize and say, OK, let's take it to its logical conclusion. What happens if the whole building, in a sense, is, is permitted light? OK, you would see strange things, perhaps, shadowingly happening through the, through the party wall. Um, but to return to my main theme of, of erecting a structure and then deviating from it, in this case, uh, another building taken from the same series is an absurd proposition. What happens if an institution, an academic institution in this case, um, sets up in part a series of very particular chambers, and, and my sort of cartoon version of the very particular chambers are these, these large domed uh, lecture halls and, and eating places and so on in the front of the building. What happens if the almost Byzantine particularized academy meets the old 60s well service shed. The back part of the building is the notion of the, the you know, the teaching place is a well service shed. And what happens if, if the one collides with the other? I think that the answer isn't necessarily given by that plan. I mean, I'm, I'm the first to, to see in it all sorts of uh, totally unresolved conditions. Nonetheless, the idea intrigued me, still intrigues me. The idea always of, <clears throat> of taking apparently ir irreconcilable points of departure, you know, the, the, the well-service shed people, for instance, meeting the carvers of Baroque space, that would be an amazing, amazing thing to try and do. Um, because I have a, a kind of intrigue with, with both of them. The, the, Storyline. This is this is a later version of, of the same project, and I suppose one can make a, a, a sort of sideways comment here about architectural drawings. Um, the drawing on the left is a rerun of the let's have it, the previous drawing on the left. <coughs> the later drawing, I think, is tightened up. The later drawing has more elements that. Uh, one can discuss uh, and identify it has specific sort of waterfall conditions and room conditions and strange things happening on the hill leading up to it. Um, but it is much more of a picture. I think that this is a thing that happens to, to we sort of drawing architects, which is that sometimes a drawing like the one on the right, which, which I feel is very unresolved, but for me, has much more interest than the later drawing on the left, which now sits in uh, an important German architectural museum uh, and probably looks nice on a wall. Uh, but the number of the number of things that it's actually doing for me is far fewer. I just make that as a as a side comment. The other thing that was was necessary to this uh, project was this building vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the city, if you remember the map of the Arcadian city. Uh, the role being played by it is analogous to the role being played by Wagner's Steinhof church vis-a-vis -vis the, main, the main body of Vienna. I, I find when one goes to Vienna that the, the Steinhof church has a very, very piquant kind of uh, role to play. And I find, I suppose one finds that, that more and more, and one, it's very difficult to explain this to students sometimes, more and more one finds that one is designing in terms of semi-conscious quotations of things. It's places that, that sort of haunt you. You can't even quite remember what they're like in detail, but you can remember the sort of thing that they are doing to the rest of the city. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you are, you, you find these things. And Steinhoff, I mean, the Steinhoff is still very... I've been 
maybe three, four times to the end, I still find it very strange. There it is, this strange, exquisite object. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's necessity as a sort of marker, but also it's necessity of being sufficiently far away from where you usually are, wherever you are in the end, <coughs> that you can't quite you can't quite grasp it, and it's surrounded by trees. Yeah. You don't even have to know that it's in the lunatic asylum. That's not the point. It's, it's that it has this strange marker role, and certain, particularly certain European cities have this. There's a, there's a sort of boring restaurant or castle or something about this boring city of Linz in, in Austria, and it's just where it sits. I'm sure if you actually got close to it, the the magic would be taken away. But I'm fascinated by. Something. I digress. Um, again, in this part of the city, the the apparently most rational element, and this is the only one of my drawings that Leo Crea likes, I have been told, uh, which is not, <laughs> not necessarily a recommendation, but anyhow. Um, it appears to be very... Does he think it's made of stone? He probably does, and of course, again, it's, gla you know, it's meant to be glass. <laughs> which uh, would probably spoil the story. Yes, he probably does think it's me. Or they have seen it's sort of, you know, it's sort of blue, which yeah. which is fairly uh, unambiguous, I would have thought. Um, it looks to be very... It was actually literally a sort of, you know, ten minute in, in a train, the idea. And even the drawing didn't take very long. It took an afternoon or a day, maybe. Um, but one then plants into this apparently very unambiguous object. One deliberately then enjoys to make the root system, the actual path system into the building, the, the, the crazy system, the, the, the silly paths that wind around. Uh, so again, one is, one is oh, incidentally, these are supposed to be the people who live in that part of part of town. The business then of metamorphosing an object uh, or playing games with something that appears to be the same is is the subject of of oh I'm losing on that one. Is the subject of this piece of the city in addition to its social scenario. Uh, the peninsula has a series of groups of four towers. It look, if you look close, it's not a single building. It's actually four, four apartment blocks which group together. And that was that was sparked off by some corners that I saw in Antwerp. There are two sets of corners. The sort of famous one in in the in the Arnevo patch of Antwerp, which where the four corners have sort of spring, summer, autumn, winter, but there's another set of corners around nearby which are not Art Nouveau, but which are very powerful grouped buildings around corners. And, and I got intrigued by this idea of having a single building which actually cuts into, cuts into four. And I was looking again, in fact, I was using in last night's lecture two slides. One was that um, Mies van der Rohe glass tower proposal where there are three sub-towers that make up the total tower in plan. And cross-referencing with it, I was using uh, Dennis Lasden's uh, housing block where the four towers actually then do begin to explode away from the core. And, and that preoccupation, um, I suppose one would say, is, is, is at the back of one's mind. Anyway, the process as one moves out onto the peninsula is that the groups of towers change. The, the organization of the tower is the same, the plan form is the same, the purpose is the same, but the actual architecture becomes different. It starts off and the, the, the slide <coughs> on the right is of a tower which is actually off the picture here. It's the, 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 the neck of the peninsula and is the fruitiest pair of, uh, is the fruitiest group of buildings. But something else is happening on the ground. Whilst the buildings move 
towards a less articulated form. They start off as highly articulated, very, very absurdly fruity. The first one still fairly articulated. The second one slightly cooler. The third and cooler still. The fourth. The converse is happening on the ground. These towers all sit onto it, slightly into the the park, which forms the peninsula. And the planning of the park runs counter. It starts off as being quite uh, orthodox, almost municipal. As one goes more towards the tip of the peninsula, the park gets slightly crazier, slightly more romantic and even spooky. And so this is happening as a as a counteraction to the progress of the towers. As we reach the tip of the peninsula, the last tower, which is actually only a pair of towers, it's not completed, it's the bow of the ship, and so you simply leave off the last two of the four, exposing the flank of the two last towers. But they're quite cool by that time. But the ground, meanwhile, has become hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, Again, this is a kind of, I suppose, a formal exercise of what happens if one, if the, process, the process of change of one set is running counter to the process of change of the other set, that the two are always joined. Oh, the, the, the scenario here is, is that it's, uh, it's a part of the city which is not connected with all those awful people in the lofts and in the, in the uh, clickety-click part of the city. They, these are the old Viennese who crawl down the ground level and go along to the delicatessen in the next block and walk the dog and go back again. The, and they demand a kind, of, it's a sort of quotation of Vien those Viennese apartments that you tend to get on the top floors. I mean, Hans Hollein's mother in, in, <laughs> lives in, in one such, where they have these enormously high, in Berlin the same, these enormously high ceilings. And it's a province in which they can keep their, their lovely furniture and their sophisticated memories and, and so on. Tracking sideways, again, the, the issue of the starting point with which we are all familiar, the apocryphal English countryside, and the way in which that, perhaps, can act as a structure for a building. I, like a lot of other people, have gone through a period of my life where I've been fascinated with how little you can express, but I'm far too monumental for that. I can't really express very little. What I've done is to hide it. The notion of the quite hot and hierarchic building hidden in a crevice. The apparent continuity of the ground is belied when you get there by actually going into the crevice and finding there's a total building organization inside it. Um, running alongside that is, I suppose, again, megastructural thinking. What can you do with a simple open frame matrix? Do you let it carry straightforward divisions of space itself? Do you play the divisions of space counter to it? Do you allow the natural, you know, one normally thought, thinks of the building, per se, and the natural bushes and trees and so on, per se. Here we have taken this hidden object into the, into the ground, but then do we allow some of the things from the ground to percolate into the architecture? Do we allow the matrix to carry some of the bushes and trees and so on that would normally be just sitting in that ground anyway? Then other conversations about this semi-transparent or fully transparent division of space. I mean, that's an old, by this time, sort of old one. It crops up again and again and again. Uh, one then, of course, I think, again, this is the teacher coming up. <coughs> and, 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 and the fact that these things aren't built, that, that sometimes you go around finding things after the event, or usually there's some, you know, you give a lecture somewhere and somebody says, there's a place 10 kilometers from here that's just like your thing. Is this, I mean, all the time I get this, and so one trots, <laughs> trots up and takes a slide of it out. I mean, the, the uh, Maginot line, near which I found myself quite frequently in the last two or three years, 
is you know, for the moment, forgetting its, its uh, overtones, if you can, it is a marvellous reservoir of objects. I mean, particularly in terms of the kind of land form. I, I mean, I think when you see those photographs of Channel Island German defences, in a funny way to me, although I've never been to the Channel Islands and don't wish to, the, the, in a funny way, there's, there's more... It's more of a set piece. It's sort of in the sand, you know. As soon as you're on, I mean, as a seaside kid, as soon as you're on the sand, you expect something strange to happen. But in the middle of, of sort of uh, Franco-German border territory, and it's sort of rolling countryside with funny old castles and the sort of bottom end of the Vosges or top end of the Vosges. These things are the more ambiguous and the more strange. They're just sort of trotting along a country lane, and then it, then there it is, tucked away. <coughs> the first time I was taken to see these was at night in the snow. It was even more bizarre. I mean, these friends of mine said, you know, you've got to come and see these things that are just like your stuff. <laughs> and we were, we were coming back from a, you know, an amazing Alsatian meal in a very, it happens to be a sort of two-star, Michelin, sort of just behind that tree somewhere, which is very handy for taking some photographs. And, and they said, you must see this thing. They were sort of slightly pissed at sort of getting out of the car. You couldn't see, you were sort of falling down the ditch anyway. And then suddenly, in the, in the moonlight, I mean, like really in the moonlight and the snow, were these very weird things. Uh, little wonder that then, of course, one is, is slightly self-conscious. There's a rerun. Um, the drawing on the right was actually done in German, or was coloured up at least, and partly drawn in Germany after seeing these things. And there are, I think they begin to be in the, what is called the Hedro city as opposed to the, the earlier drawing. Uh, there are beginnings of quotes of this. And I think then, I'm not sure quite what happens if the first, instance the thing comes if not out of your imagination then not out of a self-conscious series of quotes then you rerun it to some extent and you have got quotes built into it I'm not I'm not sure about that I've got another example uh, in a minute of that the Trondheim library which Christine and I did four years ago came after the Via Appia the 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 intersection house and in fact although it's it's a competition project for a much more hard-nosed competition. I mean, this is actually designed to the specific sizes of the various rooms in a, in a pretty tortuous building. I mean, we, this is an interesting case because we did this competition alongside our students. It's a very, just speaking again as a teacher, thing where you have a group of students making the project and you're doing it too demands a very particular uh, relaxation of the old European professorial bit. I mean, you simply have to agree that everybody will see what everybody else is doing, otherwise you can't operate at all. Um, but I think that, again, it's this question in this, in this case of needing a very hard ass point of departure in order to do the things that you really want to do. I, I, I would claim that the basic diagram of this building, which is a loop, and the basic uh, use of that diagram, which is of the entrance and the main access arcade, and the two strips that surround that arcade, which are the book stacks on the one side, and all the ancillaries, the toilets, the staircases, and so on, on the other side. A very simple, very simple basic uh, proposal. Then allows you to play silly buggers in the main part of the building. It allows the individual buildings which make up the library, the, the individual departments, to be very idiosyncratic. It allows them to contribute towards the a special landscape atmosphere rather than a hierarchical institution. Uh, and the method is this. Again, this is, this is this preoccupation with the glass wall that will not be transparent until you get to the top of it. And here one had a very good uh, excuse for doing that, which is that the restaurant is at the top 
from the restaurant you can look out and see the amazing city of Trondheim or diagonally look down and see the internal landscape of the library. And then as the glass moves down it gets more and more opaque until we're into you know, standard glass bricks. But only by having this fairly rigid ring and I would mention here the usual device in projects like this of, of going to, to see Frank Newby very early on. I always find an amazing sort of way of clearing the head. I think several of the most uh, buildable projects that I've ever worked on have been where one has gone to see Frank at an early stage. I find Frank an amazing architectural critic, not just somebody who sort of tells you I mean, he always says, yes, you can do it, and then it explains why he shouldn't. But it, it's not just a question of the sizing being right. It's actually a question of him being a very perceptive uh, analyzer of motives. Um, anyway, be that as it may, that, that one needed this tough ring from which to hang this particular building. The other thing um, is, this is the building in which our mesh preoccupation started, but I don't want to sort of take too much time going into that. The other thing about Trondheim, which is north, way north of Oslo, I think it's as, as near to Oslo as is Brussels or something, I mean it's a long, it's a hell of a north, um, is that it already has one very elegant room. It has this room in it, in the posh hotel there, the Britannia. And I was fascinated, I've always been fascinated since seeing it, of this idea of the most sophisticated room for 500 miles. You know, it, it really is the most sophisticated place, the most elegant, and with sort of almost scissor-cut grass, you know, and palms and so on, up, up, way up in the you know, middle of Norway. And I suppose one had that at the back of one's mind, and in a sense the library was meant to be an offering of a second elegant room, magic room of the garden in, in the same city. Uh, that slide on the right just is meant to illustrate the idea of the internal buildings being hinted at to the street but not actually made explicit. In, I will speed up now because I realize I've been going for more than an hour and, and the, more, more recently this business of something as a point of departure was forced upon us because we did this competition in, in Frankfurt for a, a museum using an old church. This is the requirement of the competition. We used the Carmelita Church, the center of Frankfurt, which quite honestly is pretty, th I mean, as a ch somebody who lived as a child in Norwich, for example, the Carmelita wouldn't make sort of third grade in Norwich. Nonetheless, it's all that Frankfurt has, and they, they treasure it very dearly. And I think one probably wore one's disdain for it, as a, you know, in, in terms of rating, Gothic rating, rather on one's sleeve. And, and the, the building was actually an attack on the, this third rate church. The, the, the process of the building then is that the church is the point of the departure. Uh, one attacks it, and, and there's a series of diagrams just strangely this evening have got one missing, but it doesn't really matter. The, the attack upon it is the attack of the path upon which the museum will occur. And if you, that's another thing that seems to recur, and I'm sure that I can lay at the door of some of my own teachers at the AA, the preoccupation that I think that the English have with with paths, and, and I always like to think there's an analogy here between English architectural thinking and, in a sense, English writing, that many intriguing novels or stories are written as a, a kind of storyline that doesn't really make a polemical point, doesn't really reach total conclusion, but is a, is a path along which there are strange and ambiguous incidents, and the path weaves, and it goes on. And I feel 
There's something strange about the, the English, their preoccupation often of starting the design by way of the routing, by way of the path. Anyway, this is where the path is, in effect, the museum. The path attacks the old church. It begins by exposing itself. The, the beginning of the path, which is a ramp, is exposed. And if you remember that, that in this building, in the Trondheim building, in the DOM building, which I shall come on to in a moment, the circulating path is actually the key to the whole project. The path drives through the old uh, Gothic transept, the curved part is the new part of the building, the, the rest is the existing Gothic church. It drives through it, attacks through the transept, uh, and there is part of the ramp system, the administrative end of the building. The path drives on past the transept and climbs, and this is a new exhibition hall. At the end, it, it turns at an apse, which is, in a sense, a mimic of the existing Gothic apse, and then turns back and climbs. And this path is playing a sort of strange game with a device which we call the rack, which was actually the thing upon which most of the exhibits would be placed. It turns back into the transept again, but now at a higher level, so one's playing a sort of, uh, always a game of seeing things through diagonals and, and seeing the same thing from different levels and from different angles. That's the sort of basic proposition really. Attacking the transept, passing through it into the new space, turning back, re-attacking it, turning again. And using this old Gothic church very much as a sort of punch bag, really, <laughs> or thing which to, to knife through turning, passing back again. There's the Gothic apse in this case. Uh, I think slightly glamorized over what it, what it really looks like when you're in there. Uh, that is a section through the new part of the building showing the whole ramp system. The administrative part on the left, the transept in the middle, the new exhibition gallery on the right. I haven't really got any very good slides of this yet. And then the final return back and out of the building. The DOM project, of which um, Ron was the architect along with Christine and myself, and that was an interesting thing, because the three of us had never worked together, and, and one always fears, once you start multiplying out the number of <coughs> designers on a project, that everybody might get too polite. And uh, I remember once, Ron will remember this, when we did a, when we did a Trondheim project with Cedric, Tony Dugdale, and Perkart, and a lot of people. There was a period we went through, which is the sort of after you, James, period. I mean, everybody was being so polite that you wondered whether anything would ever sort of emerge, which it did, strange enough. I think the Dom thing would move much, much faster. Um, and what I'm intrigued about here is having set up a, f a very sim simple, almost bland idea, this, this extrude, taking the DOM of the, uh, the logo of of the company, which was actually a point they made in the requirements, wasn't it? Right? That we then said, okay, let's extrude it. Let's extrude the D and the O and the M. Let's make the O the arcade. Let's make the D the sort of, I think it's the ancillaries, and the M the main offices. And it had to then turn to work itself into the site. Having done that, uh, what intrigues me again is this thing of playing within that proposition, seeing how far you can keep the rule going and nearly break it, so that the path, the actual route, which is marked here in yellow, was always within the O, but it didn't just stay in the middle of the O, it, it maneuvered its way around the O, it sometimes climbed up the O, it, it almost grazed the edge of the O territory. Um, and there is a counter 
game going on with the water that, that starts at the crotch of the building and then drops down and that the water is also playing a sort of ambiguous game around the the yellow path but they're still within the O territory so that one in a sense sets up a simple proposition and then plays within it the entrance becomes a sort of Chatsworth like waterfall the O in the entrance part of the building is part of a sort of grander more formal thing where the D and the M are part of the game and then as you in the main part the D and the M fall back into their into their prescribed roles and the funkiest part of the building I suppose is where it turns and one had <laughs> I think it was a P. Cook title the Rhineland corner which is extremely <laughs> corny right? uh, and this thing of having quite a hard ass point of departure again I think crops up but the basic proposition is really very simple and is tending to be linear again. This is just a quick reference to more recent competitions still in Finland. Uh, the site, again I don't have adequate drawings really and I didn't do very many drawings for it anyway. Uh, the site, which Ron will remember as he went to it too, is this extremely flat Finnish um, es near estuary, it's not exactly an estuary but it's a sort of um, delta condition with these straight birch trees that seem to go on forever. And my proposition is very, very simple. If you're in this birch tree condition, s the building should be a mound, should be something that you can see in those long dark evenings as a strange object. Proposition then is very simple that the strange object should be uh, the theatre. The, the strange object should be all the working parts of the theatre. And the only bit that you allow to stick out into the river is the auditorium itself. And so it's a rather simplistic proposition again. Everything goes into that slab. So the profile is important of the slab, and then you just let the, the theatre hang out. My criticism of it now would be that that forces upon you a rather sort of bizarre plan. So it comes, I suppose, as no surprise that the shadow house uses a very simple diagram as its point of departure. I mean, what I like to do sometimes is to stand away from it and describe it in the most simplistic terms and say there is a house which faces the city to the south the country to the north, the gardens to the east, and the rock to the west. The rock has water falling from it. The house is organized on two axes, a straight axis between north and south, and a slightly bifurcated axis. And the house is arranged in semicircular terraces. End of conversation, because that is actually what it is. Um, the intricacy of it then comes from sub-conversations. Uh, some of them to do with knitting, what I would call knitting. Some of them to do with this business that always fascinates me about making a static plan have apparent uh, dynamic qualities. The, 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 you know, one finds this in a lot of in a lot of uh, 20th century examples, or preferred 20th century examples. And Christine, who did most of the the drawing, was I think subconsciously referring to the sorts of diagrams that one has seen, not so much in the architectural doodles of the 20th century, but in art doodles. I mean, I remember running to find a Picabia. Uh, illustration in some Thames and Hudson book which looked almost exactly like part of the plan but I mean again one has to do this I think after the event I mean it's interesting to have that conversation once the, the, the drawing has been done slightly slightly too much if you do it before and certainly I think they were at the back of my mind in, in, in doing the model there were <coughs> certain Mahoy Naj 
uh, it was things I had seen in photographs of some of the objects, experimental objects of, of the Hainan. Um, but the point of departure is very simple. The objective was to do with ambiguous objects, was to do with shadows, was to do with glimpses, was to do with meshes, again, of, of defining space, but only by uh, screens or, how can I describe it, things that were not total. But in order to do that, the basic diagram is, or the basic intention is very simple. You can then take off. Again, this business of the diagram having the potential to, to dissolve. In the river, back to the Arcadia city, the riverside part of the city has groups of towers again, although tighter groups, yeah, riddled by water and allowing them themselves then to start to disintegrate. And the disinte in fact, the rules of the disintegration, in fact, this disintegration business isn't totally freeform because the rules of the disintegration are that it can first of all happen within the cleavages and only later happen elsewhere so that they're even a sort of a strict process by which these, these uh, apparent irrationalities might happen, albeit that then this series of... Uh, cartoons, I suppose, enjoys the audacity of very nasty and naughty things happening, and also enjoys a certain irony that after those have happened, it all returns to normal again, uh, which is a shift from the earlier sequential schemes, like the one I showed you, the Urban Mark, or the earlier one of the ad hocs, where one pitched into the future and then stopped and said, well, it's got so different by the future. In this case, one is, one is being slightly more cynical and saying, well, things always end up being much the same in the end. And this is another case where uh, after some of the mesh schemes, the, the students at Frankfurt said, oh, you must come down to Schwetzingen and see they've done your thing. This is another case of them having done your thing, except because they've, they've done it and two, three hundred years ago. And then, of course, having seen it, doing your thing after seeing how they've done your thing on the drawing, um, in the final analysis, the Lintz exhibit uh, uses a very simple Again, a very, very simple diagram proposition that on the diagonal will be five stages of miniaturization, if you like. You start off with the, the heavy mesh and it gets lighter. And then there's a sort of symbolic game about speed being to do with the diagonal and, and information being to do with the horizontal, which I don't think anybody ever <laughs> realized we were trying to do. It's always like one of those exhibition things where it all has immense meaning if you make the catalogue entry long enough. You know, if you just see it, it's a blue thing with a pink thing and a green thing in it, which is slightly underlit, which is actually, a, <laughs> would be my own self-criticism about the exhibit, which is that uh, had one been building more, one would have known that the actual object should have been more brightly lit. It was brightly lit in the model because the model didn't have any top on it. It always looked great, you know, and all bright pink and bright green. <laughs> but the, the point was that the, the lights were meant to make this comment about different speeds of movement. And they did move at different speeds, but they didn't light the bloody thing up enough. Which is a very strange bit of sort of architectural experience. Okay, that, that you know, have, had one done more buildings, one would have known that a certain amount of light is needed in order to <laughs> in order to illuminate the object, and one would have had to have thought of another way of getting this this actual movement. Nonetheless, it is it is exhilarating occasion to make something. Uh, this is the last drawing I've done. Uh, this I did in, in Oslo recently and is meant to be an anticipation of the next project. The, the, the next portmanteau project, may I say, because in fact we've got to actually build a blue house, which is much more important than anything else. But 
the next portmanteau project project will be a thing called the Layer City. Uh, as I hinted, you know, about every four or five years I do a sort of city on the side which sucks up bits and pieces. Whether the Layer City will have bits of mesh, it will probably have bits of shadow house in it. Whether it will have bits of solar house, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and I've slightly chickened in this first drawing because the drawing was done under pressure for a particular uh, requirement of <coughs> some Japanese gentlemen who want to make a calendar and were offering me such a vast sum <laughs> for making the drawing that it was an offer I couldn't refuse. So I said to myself, OK, I'll be extremely good and make it the first, first throw of the layer city. Of course, in, in fact, working at speed, what you do, as I've often said before, is that you sort of take whatever is in your pocket and <laughs> dig in your pocket and put it on the, put it on the paper. And so it is that the towers in the foreground, which are euphemistically called the outriders of this eventual city, the city is hinted at in the background, uh, fairly crudely at this stage. Uh, the outriders, in fact, take over the drawing. The outriders are the easiest bit because, in a sense, they come from stock. Um, but they have the beginnings of some, some new friends. The interest in water, now even more heroically part of the, the scheme of things, instead of uh, it appearing, say, in DOM as a polite little trickle, and in the shadow house as a fairly, fairly substantial series of trickles and, and, and baths and so on. It's now actually gushing out of the bloody thing. Um, and I hate to think what that's going to lead to. Uh, in terms of my program for this evening, what can I say about the structuring of this? The layer city has a very clear idea in the back of my mind which is what happens if you organize a city such that the, the ground has a series of cuts which are mainly running in the same sort of direction. They may be small valleys or, or even watercourses, let us say. The land division is running in a counter direction, deliberately counter direction, but still also fairly parallel one to the other. The access system is then running deliberately ambiguously to those two, and the actual pitch of the buildings is organized such that it too is another layer, and that these several layers, and so it becomes in a sense not only a three-dimensional mesh series, but the uh, function distinction, the, the natural ground, the land divisions, the roots, the buildings, that's, and perhaps the structuring, and, and certainly lines of trees, will all be different series of meshes, different series of layers. That's sort of the, the uh, program at the back of my mind. It will be much easier when I've got it down on paper and can see it again. It probably is a very simple diagram. The diagram back of my head for it is, is, is still a very simple one. Um, Oh, there's also another, just a final aside, about Norwegian colouring. I have a horrible feeling that it's Norwegian colouring. Uh, I don't know why, but it looks like, it, the colours look like Norway. I've been looking too many local carpets or something. Um, I'm sure there are questions which, which you want to ask. What would be a good idea if we fill all that glasses and then, and then perhaps have some sort of
It's a bad pair in 20 minutes. No. <laughs> I think Nick's just about to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one way to start the discussion. Oh, yeah. Could you just sort of swap seats all the way around? <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you saying? <laughs> Try to the glass down there. Good luck. You want me to say something? Yes, I think we, we let, let's start the discussion. Yes. What, what, what in, I mean, I must say, I thought the drawings were actually beautiful. Yeah. Really great. Um, what intrigues me is. Um, this thing about being a teacher, and Peter was my tutor when I was the AA. The art teacher who always is dissatisfied. And, um, however many people he inspires, and um, do go off and do things and um, so on. Always feels that um, really he's you know, failed and wants to be a, a great artist. And um, there's a lot of, um, I think there's sort of a lot of quite a lot of parallel in in that in a way in that in that. Um, he just still has this great urge that, that really until he's built vast buildings and schemes that somehow he won't have succeeded. Um, and underrates the kind of inspirational quality of, uh, of what he does, I think. And uh, I, I think there's quite a lot of... Um, I think there's quite a lot of interest in... in um, for me, in, in that thought, but there he's been for kind of 20 years doing well, inspirational drawings to a lot of people. Um, he claims he does them in a sense for his own enjoyment, or, you know, uh, underplays it very much, in, in a, in a, and, and sort of also claims that it's sort of things he happens to be interested in, and is kind of an ego trip in some way. But um, I think he's done a lot for. What he's done has done a great deal for the architectural world generally, and there are sort of spin offs in all kinds of directions. And uh, given his kind of energy, I think you could go on doing that for another 10 years and then spend 25 years after that actually building the things. So I, mean, I don't think there's really any hurry at all. <laughs> uh, my well, he's certainly succeeded in me, it used to annoy me. You were trying to annoy him, you annoyed me. I don't, I, and in fact, to the extent that I never even look at your drawings, usually, if I can avoid it. <laughs> and uh, I was rather surprised this evening. They're quite pretty and so on, but they're certainly not annoying anymore. In fact, they're almost obvious. But that's the English thing, No, well, I think they have become very Arcadian. <laughs> There seems to me to be 
Sunset, um, what do you call it? Sunset, uh, yes. Sunset City. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no. <laughs> no. You used to correct me, but I'd, I'd like to characterise it by the, by the armature or the backbone that earlier schemes have in them. Uh, uh, the Plague in City, as far as I remember, was all armature. Mm -hmm. And the... And the uh, the bits and pieces that people actually inhabited were very subject to that armature. And then, then in Peter's work in the early 70s, sometimes you see these terrifically powerful armatures that are set up in order to establish the ground against which to play. Uh, and, and it seems to me now that, that it's not less... it's not less uh, shocking or otherwise it's just there's less armature. But the architecture, the, his architecture is growing up to the point where it doesn't have to uh, establish these immense extraneous objects in order to create space and to bound space uh, uh, as, as, in order to create space as a series, as a series of hollows, which, which I think your later buildings do, and I, I'll refer to them as buildings, because they seem to me, one shuts one's eyes actually when Peter's talking, he's using a language we all share, uh, and it's discussing skin and, and, uh, and sticks and, and roots and paths uh, through space and, and point and counterpoint, and a whole series of wonderful architectural discussions. But I, I mean, why I, why I like, I, I mean, I think the work gets better and better. And it's with the demise of the, of the leaning on the armature, to some I, extent, what's well, parallel with that, it's not because of that. I can't agree with that, actually. I, I'm not convinced, but I think the armature is the best thing in all the drawings, and that's, the drawings are absolutely stunning. The one that Leo Pierre liked, I must say, I like very much, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Um, That's funny, because I, I find that one very boring myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like your boring one. I thought the Dong project, for instance, was absolutely stunning outside, but inside was, seemed to me deliberately chaotic, and I couldn't, I really couldn't enjoy it inside at all. I, I, and the last outriders, I, I did find very difficult to take, whereas I did enjoy your description of the different layers. Um, I couldn't enjoy the outriders. Can I just comment on the armature thing? Because in fact, it, it, whether it is less um, obsessive as an object, but it's still, I mean, the thing, the point of the scene is to say that, that it's there. I mean, I need it. Mm. Uh, I, I find that if I'm starting off, if it's just me, but even if it's with Chris or with Rama, one needs to draw that grid, almost a grid diagram, even before you have an idea for the armature, you draw a grid, I always find myself drawing some sort of grid to get going. I'm sure a lot of people in this room do exactly the same thing. Like sure. The armature sure. is there, even if it is a almost pin, pin width. Yes. Uh, whether now it needs to be as, as heroic as an object, I mean, I, I'm glad to think that maybe it doesn't need to be, because I think that's rather primitive to say this is the point of departure and there it is, and then everything, but everything else is crawling around underneath it. But it's still, I, I, I quite like um, being able to describe apparently muddly looking or complex looking things by a very simple description. Again, the other day in the lecture I was showing a picture of um, Gaudi's apartment block, whatever it's called, on the corner, and, 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 and trying to make the point that really it was just like a London uh, mansion block. If you, if, you just add, if you just describe what's going on, you know, long uh, apartments with several rooms in the strip and the kitchen at the back, and a light well and the lift going up somewhere between the two light wells, just like anywhere else. And that's rather, and, and then, then also uh, something like uh, the hotel scheme by Pancho Geddes, which is just bedrooms on, mm. a, uh, on mm. a corridor. And I like that. I like to be able to still start off with, I mean, if I find if we start off with something where the armature system is very complicated and has a hierarchy of ten, then you cut the, the end result. It's all you can just fight for control. The, the armchair is a grid, it's a sort of managing setup. Uh, 
against which to work and play and with which to work and play, mm -hmm. to make places. It's as you describe it, I understand. But I was perhaps using Armakir inaccurately as as that process that actually went on a lot in, in the 60s schemes, not yours particularly, but in many, of introducing into the world and the city an extraneous element that it didn't need, like a single level-topped block that went all the way from Milan to Birmingham or whatever, in order to, in order to create an architecture against it. And I think some of your buildings, as um, some of all our buildings, did, did and do that, did, have done and uh, have done that in the past. Um, um, which is why I enjoy your schemes, that that up the ones that aren't doing that, mm. the ones that I mean, I think to talk about a layered city, and actually uh, actually seeing the city as a series of layers in this plane and this plane, when all planes. It's actually to talk about the nature of embodying the hollows in which we live, or might live, and is le much less dependent on on an extraneous element introduced for the solely for the purpose of of dealing with that extraneous element. But it seem, only seems slightly clear to me about. Is I didn't understand that too. Right. <laughs> what did you mean, really? But there was a period. Uh, oh, one still sees it. The last thing the city needs, as I see it now, and I, I haven't always seen it that way, but as I see it now, the last thing the city needs is any major, any vast thing thrust through it in order to engage a new world against it. Because we... I feel that destroys space, but but that the city as a spa as as a series of spaces of various different natures and importances. I won't say hierarchy, uh, but a uh, space of various different natures, surrounded by enclosed spaces, which are buildings, which is, express themselves to greater or lesser extents in the surrounding those spaces seems to me to be an extremely interesting discussion which Peter's, Peter is, is now involving himself in. But there was a very strange thing yesterday which Ron will remember, which was with just during a whole series of uh, A students who are into six, I mean, it's the 60s revival. Mm. And it's back in, in the world of, of, admittedly, it's to do with doing coin street. A large site, but there were all those old sixties conversations. How about a deck that runs from you know, Victoria Station to London Bridge, or how about a what about some of the other old old? There were several yesterday, weren't there? Ron? But they, they, a lot of that came out of the, the Coin Street situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the bridge, the, thing the river, setting up sure. this giant the deck. Sure. Uh, yeah. coat hanger sure. of some sort. How well, about a row of towers? How about a giant bridge? How about you know, it's always the sort of how about this thing, and then the rest will just as you've described. Send them to Basingstoke <laughs> is the answer, really, because there's a deck injected into an English market town to its ultimate and perpetual destruction. <laughs> because it's a, uh, it's I mean I one can only use sort of uh, quite tried architectural phrases by saying it's out of scale. It just doesn't work. Uh, it's why I like your arcade. Nice walking around with a deck in your back. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering whether <coughs> one of the useful things of Peter's drawing is that they are really cities on the mind. And, and because um, if you look at the forces of affecting almost every city in the Western world, that they actually they are disintegrating. Um, in fact, the city, while the impulse to the city, or the, what we need for place, is changing, uh, our means of making it is also changing. It, uh, changing. And it certainly is going away from the, the traditional notion of the city as such, um, as a sort of economic generator. The, the, for the, the reason actually why Coin Street is being debated, for instance, is because actually, 
it's touch and go whether um, Coin Street actually is going to be an economic success. Um, um, and you know they are having to pour, pour more resources in to this particular area actually to make it a success. So then, um, so well, this is some of the digression. What I'm saying is that the one of the useful functions of Peter's drawings is that this is the baggage actually we can carry around in our mind, in our retina, while actually we're dealing with the city of reality, which actually might be our own back garden, as it were, um, as we become suburbanized. Um, as um, telecommunications and uh, various things um, force the city to, to disintegrate. These are great, wonderful mental images of um, uh, a utopia which we um, uh, carry around. And, you know, one mustn't um, uh, belittle uh, the notions of utopias, but almost by definition, they're, they're uh, cities that don't get built. And then that, you know, the um, uh, suburban uh, the sort of tanks, the, uh, the main uh, armatures. Um, I think there is an there is a, um, uh, an affinity there. But I, I, I what my, my mind goes back to, so perhaps you know, the sort of paintings of Rothko and Pollock, and they actually. Um, you know, they're being built 20 years later. So this is the, the, the span. And what I'm saying is that, uh, what I'm thinking is that actually we cannot do um, certain things today, which could be done, could be done in the 18th century. There's been a shift. Um, uh, perhaps we cannot actually build um, cities anymore. Are they our means of doing it? At least the cities of the, um, as we imagined, uh, as we mentioned them in the past. Um, We've actually got to think in terms of Peter's um, imagery. Part of it is imaginary. We carry out it now. I mind. We don't have to do it. Uh, um, we have magazines. We have the media. Um, various things that actually mean we don't actually have to build our fantasies. We, the way the, the institutions influence our lives and hold our society together, don't actually have to have Corinthian columns and uh, sculpture and things like that. Um, they will influence us in various, uh, various other ways. But if your 18th century city, your the, the powers of, of um, you know, the, the iconography of the city and architecture were terribly important uh, for the way society held itself together in the 18th century. We've got other means of doing this um, today. And I would say that it's this, uh, perhaps Peter's imagery actually is much more um, in that realm of um, being providing our our um, mental uh, baggage, um, uh, uh, I think what is nice is actually he does actually is still believes in the city um, uh, as a mega structure. Um, perhaps we all would like to see that, um, but none of us actually would want to live in it. I'd just like to comment on that in an oblique way. When, when, when both you and Ken were talking, I mean, in a sense, I, I'm a bit frightened if, if, if it all seems terribly sort of reasonable. Because I, I, exactly a week ago, um, and I shall use it in a lecture in a, probably about three weeks' time, and we'll drop it all together. But exactly a week ago, I went to a place north of and uh, northwest of Oslo, which I'd heard about on the Oswegian Great Time, which is a, a town called Ulusund, that's A with a thing over the top. Uh, and it's 
a town which is about 50,000 people now. In 1902, virtually the whole town was burnt down, or at least the whole central part of the town was burnt down. And in two and a half years, it was rebuilt in the Arnuvary Manor, or even still Manor, depending on what you know. And it's really quite, it's quite a shock to the system. I mean, I'd heard about this on the grapevine, and it hasn't really been written up in any magazine as yet. It I'm has, having. it has been has in some been? magazine. Mm. Ah. I can't remember which one. Because I couldn't find it, or I'd like to know which, because I'd I could... like to remember, but I can't. I'll try it's try. very strange, because there you go, and in order to get to this place, it's, there's one road that connects it with the rest of Europe, but basically you fly in. You don't even fly into the place, you have to fly in onto an island, which is sort of then you get a ferry boat and all this business, and finally you make this place that's locked by mountains. And it's our nouveau, you know, there's streets and streets in our not just a couple of streets, a lot of it. And um, there it is, you know, that this intrigues me culturally. Okay, you can argue that it is possible to, f to give our nouveau frontage and side styling to what are basically uh, brick buildings with immense timbers inside, in the timbers being in the sort of boat building tradition. Okay, but that's a cultural thing. It really hit me, you know, the very fine style. Mm. Not not the Brussels are nouveau, not not nasty, but still pretty pretty good. And that 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 hits across the system because it, it it doesn't fit the convenient thing about, you know, Janus Loki and, and, and indigenous Indigenousness and so on. There were these guys, sophisticated guys. What I, 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 who brought it in? Who brought it in? And they did it in two and a half years. And then one or two buildings are very sophisticated, <coughs> like really, really beautifully stuffed. And a few weeks back, I was in Gothenburg, which is a, a boring city with some very good human steel. And I'm now already inventing in my mind the story. What happened? I would imagine. My story is that, that they finished all of them and they were out of work and they're just like the sort of blokes that go to Nigeria now and then, you know, the job's over and so they'll do a couple of jobs in Saudi. And <laughs> they were trotting down to Gothenburg. Six years later, mm -hmm. you take the dates as a thing, it works exactly. And they trotted down to where the money was, you know, and all this stuff going up in Gothenburg. You can see the same details. I'm sure some of those blokes mm -hmm. were the same blokes. Mm -hmm. But it, it does cut across the bows of our sort of comfortable thing, like, you know, so it burnt down because it was timber and it was rebuilt in brick. But the guy, I found out so much that the guys, most of them were trained in, in Germany in Munster. And if you look at the map, you find that Munster, you know, if you want to invent it, is conveniently placed for Nancy, Brussels, and the valley culture coming up from Darmstadt, etc. And then they hot-footed it up to this place, and then you conveniently find that the Kaiser Wilhelm used to have his summer holes up by all of a sudden. It all starts fitting. But, but there it is. It's got nothing to do with anything there. And you suddenly get there, it's all these buildings with little pinnacles and sort of bar-relief roses, and, and there's even one building with, with detailing taken straight from Victor Orta. I mean, absolutely straight. Okay. And then you think, well, okay. Because it's now X years old, and it's a nice, quaint old place, and the Aus Oswegians love it, or the, the, the people up there love it, you know, but what did they think at the time? Were they shocked? Was it opportunism? You know, the place had burned to the ground, so they didn't really care what went up as long as it didn't burn. And so you, this group of people sold them a very sophisticated, very stylized architecture without, without them realizing it. And that, in a curious way, although it's fairly small scale and it's up there and locked away, it brought out all those old instincts of mine of fuck them, let's give them style. You know, I like sure. <laughs> in the final analysis, it, they didn't piss about, they did it. They brought all the latest ideas up from Germany and they did it and then they <coughs> what <laughs> the only difficulty is finding out what happened to these guys afterwards. One turned up as a professor in Trondheim and the other did the post office in Trondheim. They're the two that you hear about. The rest did they marry local fisher folk or did they go back down to where the money was? I mean I that I, I don't know if it's relevant to but I sort of feel that instinct at the back of 
you know, should one start getting worried when it all starts getting nice and neatly pigeonholed and comfortable? Because those guys didn't care. Or did they? Or did they then start doing farmhouses up on the hill? I'm not sure. But that really hit me. Not in the way that it would be expected to, because it's all now historic and preserved and everybody loves it. But what struck me was how alien it was. Delightfully, I mean, I much prefer it to bloody mountains anyhow, but it was delightfully alien and delightfully sophisticated. What are the insides of the houses like? Are they pretty ordinary? Uh, some, well, I, didn't, I saw the inside of some warehouses, which are just amazing construction. But um, do they live in an art nouveau way? Yeah, of course they do. I know a few buildings. There are a few buildings that are. There, there, there's the, the, the posh hotel, which I stayed in, is still on the and, and uh, a couple of villas. And some of the apartments, sort of. But then you see, it, it's not, 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 not anything in sort of Brussels. Mm -hmm. And you do pose this very interesting question, aren't you, with the, the game that my wife and I play. We just come back from. Edinburgh. We, we, you know, one knew that Edinburgh was built for a sort of high, sophisticated middle class um, professional, mostly lawyers. And we thought, well, what would um, this sort of um, important sort of sector, the population, where would they live today if they were doing this? Um, uh, and obviously, Port Grimo was the only equivalent we could think of. It would be equivalent to sort of 18th century Edinburgh. Now, um, this is where uh, um, your affluence, uh, and they go around with their, uh, their, their hobbies with great intensity. So we can't say it is superficial, it is not part of our culture. Port Grimo is very much part of our culture. It's where you go and you, you wear expensive casual clothes, and you, you enjoy your expensive um, pleasures with great, with great intensity and professionalism. Um, so that we can't write off Port Grimo. It is a problem I think we've got to address ourselves to. Um, and you know, you're addressing yourself to this problem, it strikes me. Could I uh, ask you, you know, two, two things which intrigue me a lot. Um, when you do your drawings, uh, the, the way you talk about your drawings, you, you talk as if um, you were actually sort of making it up as you went along. You said, uh, um, Intrigued, what would happen if I did this or the other? So it seems to be a very strange way. I mean, if I make a drawing, I can't draw, but if I try and make a drawing, I think first and then I draw, and I know exactly before I draw what I'm going to draw. You, you have a way of speaking as if uh, you were surprised of what you find when you draw, as if you are discovering things which you didn't actually know before you started, or did I misunderstand it? Yes, it, it varies, of course, from, from case to case. I mean, I would <coughs> claim that if, if we're doing, you know, particularly if there's more than one person, then you're doing a competition. Uh, clearly, you you know, there are, there are um, underlayers. I mean, one always tends to draw in the traditional manner of drawing in ink on tracing paper. You know, that, I don't find it particularly comfortable to draw in any other way. Occasionally, mm -hmm. not comfortably. And there are scribbles and underlays. I'm not a, I'm not a good artist. I'm not a good sketcher. And compared with my friends, compared with Ron or Chris or other people, I don't have a lot of, of sketches because I'm not a good sketcher. So as soon as I think you saw on the on on the thing one diagram, for instance, which was sort of things interlocking for the shadow pattern. That's about as far as I need to get it before, I, if, if I'm trying to work out something a bit tricksy. Uh, and I know Ron has, does the same thing as me, which is sometimes you would rather do a dummy run, which is perfectly drawn, and then about a third of the way through you don't like how it's coming out, and you tear it up and start yeah. again. Yeah. Race over it. Yeah. Um, but Okay, in competition schemes, one tends to do, uh, to work the thing out. I find it's curious, um, even when there are two or three of you working, uh, we tend not to 
do, do, do too much in the in the pre drawing. Otherwise, it sort of kills it. It freezes it. It gets sometimes it gets overripe. Actually, there is a danger in the thing. I I I'd say this thing about taking things out of your back pocket because you do have elements. I mean, you know. If you look hard, you'll find there's a usual way of doing a staircase. One actually it does a staircase the same way. It may look different or come in a different context, but there are standard mm -hmm. tricks, standard things. You, you know that if you have, say, that that amount to fill up by by midnight, <laughs> there's something out of the bag you can fill it up with which looks interesting. There are lots of freewheel parts, I mean, in those things. Um, the pro, but but if you take a sort of average, say say one of the Arcadia things, which is sort of not a composition, uh, and is having to vaguely fit into a general program, there's a clear, yes, the program is the right. Well, there's a clear program in one's mind. There's a clear intention. There will be a half mile strip. It will get smaller. It will get to, you know the top will meet the bottom. It will fragment into small houses. There will be a grid of panels. The, pan the one, one works out the sort of size of the grid of the panel. One half draws the plan, but doesn't complete the plan. <coughs> then you start at the left hand side. I didn't even know whether it was going to be five five panel drawing yes, or six yes. panel. It sort of you sort of measured it when you got halfway along and said, Oh, I reckon it's going to be another two, isn't it? Um, and it and it and uh, the top quite frankly, it's sort of masturbatory, isn't it? It sort of comes up as it comes up. You think, oh, I've got a lot of red lately. Oh, there's rather a lot of, there are a lot of pitch roof ones there. Ah, let's see what happens if we put, uh, as there is this sort of quote of a, a modern block of flats. There's one bit where there's a little block of, sort of four stories of balconies, mm. horizontal yeah. balconies. Uh, having done that, it would be crass to requote. Yes. But there's another little group which is sort of slightly arts and crafts, but one doesn't want that. One is sort of. I think the nearest analogy I can think of is, is if I'm no musician, but I, I mean, I can't really read music, but I can understand the analogy with scores. I mean, mm. scores are fascinating. I think mm. I like it. It's like a sort of half follow a score, and you can see where in, in musical composition there are very definite similar patterns. There's a general and, and reading the theme, musical the theme, there's, a, there's an intention that you are going to, I don't know, move to the key of D or something, or you're going to reach a crescendo shortly. You know, you don't know exactly whether it's in bar 28 or bar 32, but it's got to be somewhere around there, and it sort of starts wanting to... But it's, a, it's a process which you can... Yeah. But it Not afford to rules. do in reality. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the other thing uh, which I, I, I'd like just to ask you, and then I shut up, is um, I'm sure it's Persian carpet work. Uh, yeah, with the deliberate mistake. But um, when you talk about your um, cities, your various city schemes, um, you use um, elements which you don't actually can't possibly like, like this very harsh steel wall. I mean, this is an deliberately unpleasant thing. You 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 you, you called it stark or, or vicious or did that tower at the end. I mean you do things which you actually use words which are not very flattering to the kind of thing. Are these uh, just exercises because they intrigue you or are they actually places you would like to see realized or, or something like it? I I think that, that one needs to be on the edge. I think that as soon as it all starts being too comfortable I get Worried, and I think that I can't. How can I say it? That there, there are certain things that, that one would like if one did them, but one doesn't like at the moment. I mean, I, I do think it would be actually much more tolerable to have a, a street of steel panels than I any street I've seen that's like. Even if you live behind them. Oh yes, because you live behind them. You. you, 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 you experience them differently anyway, because in fact the back of the scheme, you see, as soon as you get into the scheme, look at the back of it, it starts disintegrating straight away. Oh, uh, not really. really, I mean, in mm. fact, it's only a facade. I mean, that's the trick of it. It is a facade as much as, you know, Gloucester Place is a facade, or Regent's Park Terrace is a facade. Uh, it is actually a facade. It is It is more brute than... Than it really it's is. It's a bit sort of masochistic, isn't it? To, to oh, yes, I think, and I, I, I mean, I think, you yeah. know, here we are. I mean, I, 
Uh, I think that's that's reasonable. I, I think that, that it is also a sort of attack upon Englishness, which I'm very conscious of. If you first you attack the city, then of course the people who have it attack the object. And yeah. I mean, I suppose one of these sort of dream mega structures which are actually constructed with a company like that. Is, is, is one of the most daunting and sort of attackable things almost in Scotland. And of course is attacked. Or come out. Yes. Yeah. And that 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 that, that centre, that main centre which it, but it, it it is it certainly um is disturbing. And maybe it's it's very salutary. But coming back to the other thing, I d I don't I, I understand totally or or way back, because it always seems to me that surprise is the most reassuring thing. It's actually part of the search. Yes, I, I just to come back on that issue, um, I think you can, uh, certainly, you can have an overripe design, and one is very conscious oneself when it's gone over the top. And there is this sense of sort of trying to, and okay, if you have enough time to, to rework, rework. I think, for instance, there was one of the one of the solar houses, uh, which I didn't show the theme, but one of the house types, which, in fact, two of the house types, which I think got over right, uh, because almost, not that we had too much time, but, but they're very small in scale as objects and very hot in terms of rather hot in terms of designing. And I think that there were diagrams of both of those types which were more satisfactory at an earlier scale in the final competition. And it's interesting that the one that's, that's going to be built first, the blue one, is the coolest of all the four types, uh, which is actually the one that was edited down. I mean, it was actually simplified, progressively simplified. So writing process starts that way. Um, but I, I, the, the thing about the, the horrendous uh, panels, I mean, the, the New York lofts, uh, I found those streets around Soho in New York, I mean, still as an English person, I'm quite familiar with them now, slightly frightening. And yet there are lots of lovely people one day who live in the, and behind them, and when you get up the rickety elevator that was only really made for bringing up industrial where well, uh, illegal I think that they, they seem to have them. Um, and I find that absolutely as an English person absolutely fascinating. There's this place that looks like, you know, the the, the earthquake is about to happen or some some dire thing is about to happen. And you feel like that it's really tough building. You go in, you go up to some very it may be elegant loft or sort of sophisticated atmosphere, whatever the hell it might be, uh, that, that it, it doesn't fit the English notion that if it's sweet on the outside, it's probably sweet on the inside, or if it's tough on the outside, it's probably tough on the inside, it gets complete reverse line. And that was very deliberately inspired by that. And also, of course, you've got the sweet thing that would take over. I remember that I didn't show the sleep building tonight, but the, the sleep corner one, um, where there's this very shiny, multicolored building, and then there's some undergrowth that's attacking it, almost like a sort of cancerous growth. And I showed this once in, to some friends in Vienna, and Max Pintner said to me, does the, does the nice architecture win? And I said, oh yes, I'm English, so the nice architecture <laughs> wins. And he said, were you Viennese, the cancerous growth would have destroyed it. <laughs> and I think that's, that's always, you know, one is in the end um, victim of the picturesque. I, I feel very much yeah, like I, that. I, I, sorry, I find, I, that's I should, an English thing, yeah. I think. I, I, I should preface what I can say by saying what you, you certainly used to annoy me when I was a student very much. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, what, what I find very interesting about what, what you're doing is, which I, I enjoyed it very much, uh, look, looking at what you've shown, um, because I, it's, it has a wonderful presence uh, as art, um, and it's very, very real. Um, but you, your, your situation um, 
which you seem to slightly regret, as, been, uh, as has been commented, or standing aside from actual building, seems to me to have put you in a very sort of important position, really, um, as kind of uh, continuing sort of uh, inventor of um, a very fertile kind of radicalism, um, which is perhaps born of the situation in which you first started doing it, and is probably over the last sort of 10 or 15 years would, would to me be increasingly kind of peculiar in relation to the situation in which a lot of us have found ourselves um, in practice, particularly in the sort of situations which um, we work in, with, with, which are, well, taking housing or public housing as being the most extreme kind of pole apart from where you, you are. Um, and uh, sort of listening to you and, and seeing your work kind of churns up for me all kinds of dilemmas about, about sort of where we all are. Um, I suppose what I resist about it um, is a sense that, that that the kind of radicalism which it implies is actually terribly difficult um, to do in such a way that it actually um, relates um, to to, to um, real situations. And if that was true, it might not be true in your story about the the uh, Oswegian uh, sort of younger still village is kind of nice, was a nice one. And I, actually, I kind of like the idea that what I'm going to say isn't true and isn't inevitable. But I, I certainly feel slightly beaten into, into the situation in which I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, the, the problems with it are twofold, I, I think. One is that um, the accomplishment of such sort of um, visual notions, which are very beautiful in the way you've presented them in actual spatial experience and all the other sorts of cliché terms that architects use, is actually, I think, terribly <coughs> difficult to do. In fact, I mean, I think the most kind of worrying thing for me actually building things is actually whether, whether it's going to be good or not um, uh, as an actual um, spatial experience, whether the material is going to lend support to the kind of place you're going to make and whether the wind isn't going to blow through the holes underneath or, or whatever. There are all those sorts of problems and Philip's said, you know, Cumbernaud, it seems to me essentially Cumbernaud and actually say the South Bank complex are for me sort of uh, failures in the sense of a visionary scene which didn't actually work because actually what you experience is not is quite different to the intention. Um, and the other thing is that, um, and this again goes back to the, your sort of Oswegian thing, is that um, I think that architecture is um, a social activity in, in the same way as sort of as dresses, and I more and more feel, it's a rather cynical viewpoint, that the opportunities are very closely related to the, the way in which society wishes to, the way in which the promoters of architecture wish, wish to dress themselves. I mean, the buildings are, are um, part of the presentation which um, uh, the promoters of those buildings um, wish to use in order to expand their egos upon the world. In Venice, is absolutely essentially that kind of um, a series of expanded egos of, of um, you know, all the palaces down the canals. And the success of Bath, and I suspect the reason why we all like Bath and why people watch Brideshead revisited on the box, is that we actually admire the style of part of society which we sort of pretend we, that's pretend we don't wish to emulate, but that there's that sort of thing. And um, it does seem to me that that, that um, that's a very real kind of problem and that the modern movement in general is a, a movement which was implicitly about kind of social revolution and caused architecture in England to become not nice and sweet um, because it lost contact with the middle class that had been its successful promoters during the arts and crafts movement, has resulted in a situation which we now find ourselves 
which, where we, we try to retrieve the, a relationship, a professional relationship with, with society. Uh, and your position um, is very sort of um, uh, provoking, I think, because your extraordinarily fertile invention is still um, sort of successfully detached from the things that I feel are, are um, very difficult to, to handle. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a question or a statement, but I'm going to stop. Well, if it's a question, I don't know. All I can say is yes, but I'm going to carry on. Um, I know, I'm, I'm, at the, <coughs> I'm at the moment uh, working most of the time till Christmas in, in an architecture school in Oslo, which is very much more consciously part of the mood of 1968, or at least much more consciously concerned with being socially relevant than certainly the institution of Bedford Square. Socially relevant to who? To who? Oh, to, to a, a kind of highly democratized state. I mean, nearly all the students, I mean, for instance, the primary conversation is about wheelchairs on almost any uh, morning. Is sort of can, can, and, and one of the students was telling me the other night that uh, this, this preoccupation with making sure that, that every building, even in, in interim crits of a sort of large design project, that all, all, every part of the building would be accessible to the disabled, leads now to, on the part of the slightly more witty or vicious, yes, on the part of the more witty students, leads now to various amazing vicious jokes and vicious sort of schemes monkey as to what would happen to these people in real I mean it's got to be such such a social conscience situation that the brighter students invent amazing nasty things that could happen to these people <laughs> and I don't blame them I mean it gets to, to, to a point and, and um, the, it is the only place and I not only work there occasionally set programs elsewhere and only place where there's constant, for instance, I've written a brief for one of the parts of the project, and I had miscalculated the, the allowance for provision of the heating chamber or something, I mean, something fairly precise, and, and they'd, they'd spotted it. And the, the sort of requirements of car parking and so on, so on, so on, come in, in their minds, and particularly the things for the disabled and the thing for, you know, how will it be funded and so on, so on. So on. Uh, I must admit that I find I've managed to beat them down on this because the people attracted to, to my project tend to be those that are irritated by this as well. But that makes my sound deliberately insensitive. I mean, there is a situation there. It's a highly democratized country. Um, much more so than, than this, or at least it reminds one of, of certain bits of political idealism. Working themselves up. But I think I'm talking about something that I'm talking about, sort of, is, of how you, I mean, I, I, I but, but, but you see, I do in the end, I'm not a political animal. Uh, my only, I mean, I really am not, and my only irritation is with being a reason, I think that, that there's too much English architecture, and Scandinavian architecture, that is reasonable. That, that if the reason, you know, it's always reasonable, it won't hurt um, anybody. But no, it's not a subversive, it's actively subversive. And obviously, that's jolly, jolly good there. I mean, it is a constructive subversive role you're playing. Um, if, if things it's very odd when you day. feel yourself surrounded, as I do sometimes in Oslo, by this terribly reasonable. I mean, the whole society is incredibly reasonable. And people speak with quiet voices and don't have newspapers on Sunday. I'm not sure whether when I go to an article it's reasonable or not, but I try, I'm rather stunned to hear that you're actually building one of your one of those houses, <laughs> and that um, you are still also yeah. designing another city. Uh, and I'm a little bit worried about what I see in the slides. That there doesn't seem to be any information at all about the detail or the textures that Richard was referring to, that sometimes don't come out the same as the drawings. And do you find that there's an area where you have to stop because it no longer interests you? Or, I mean, you know, where is the information about whether, you know, it actually would be silk on the walls or, um, you know, the, the, what would let the light through? I mean, what, what are the materials that allow this perforation of the walls to let the light through? And 
Um, do you want to investigate that sort of thing or not? Sometimes. I mean, for instance, in the Trondheim Library, the, the important drawing is actually the detailed section, which actually tells you that sort of information. And in fact, is extremely important to that. I mean, just to take that particular project. In the, I, I don't want to sort of prove that I can do it uh, to you this evening, but uh, I think that the, to, to answer your question obliquely rather than avoid the issue, sometimes I don't think it's important, sometimes I think it is. Uh, and it depends case for case. In the case of the Trondheim Library, in the case of the uh, solar houses, yes, in fact, in the case of the solar houses, it becomes uh, absolutely critical, and the terms of reference by which we had to even enter that competition were stringent. I mean, the, the whole project had to be checked and measured by a research institute, which then put all the schemes through computer checking for the actual materials used and the, the heat holding and so on, and, and you know, one of the four was thrown out and the other three got through that sieve. Uh, we had various people holding our hands and, and leading us through the German building regulations, which are very strange. Uh, I don't know whether that answers your question. No, I, the real answer is sometimes it matters to me and sometimes I deliberately if you like, put my head in the sand, or just really don't want to get bogged down, otherwise it will stem the flow. But it is not, there's not a, an even pitch to this. I mean, one has to then distinguish between item A and item B. I think uh, I was brought up, before I ever came to there, in, in, a, in a working in an office and studying in a small school of architecture, where the a priori conversation was always, you know, will the brick you're chosen to let the water through, and you know, you can't do it because we can't get the wood. And I suppose five, I think it was about, no, four years of that, at the beginning of one's architectural career, probably breeds an intense irritation. It wasn't so much will it let the water in, as will it look as good as it does in the drawings? Oh, it never does. But the drawing never looks as good as one's image in the back of one's head. I mean, there's a, there's a chorology back there. The drawing never looks right. None of those drawings to me look what I actually would wish the thing to be about. So what you're visualizing is a, is a real building, is a real light, and things going through. No, what I'm, what I'm saying is, in answer to that, that, that we never actually get to that point. Even, even, the, even the, particularly the glossiest drawings, even the ones that had the most time spent on them with a maximum amount of careful airbrush masking, or whatever the ones the criteria of drawings might be, it never looks like like I can describe to you what I think the layer city ought to be about. I bet you, even if somebody, you know, gave me a year's money to just, which actually would be rather boring, because then he wouldn't have the edge. But anyhow, even if I had the ideal circumstance, and the pen was flowing brilliantly, you know, suddenly one had new ways with, with drawing technique, it still won't look right. It never gets quite there. How can you be using a different medium? No, no, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that the idea is always ahead of the object, like the example I gave in the lint thing, you know. The model didn't fantastic. get it right, the, ob the actual built object didn't get it right, and the symbolism, the crude symbolism one was using with these meshes and lights and various other things dangling around inside it, still didn't get it right. Nonetheless, it might or might not be a pleasing object to a third party. And I, I'm sure that must apply to buildings as built. Even if you were the dad's hand at choosing, you know, marble or whatever it was, you know, you got it right every time. But then there might be, there's always a, a strange circumstance. You know? Isn't that a pleasure actually looking at your work? Because you actually are that flash gap between the object you're looking at and the, and the imagined um, object um, in the recipient's mind. And so this is what you, um, this is why one looks at Picasso or something like that, or any work of art, um, that you um, are in, in that gap between the object and the ideal. Um, you actually may do a bit of work. <coughs> it fires your imagination, the recipient's imagination, to, to go on further, make that leap. 
There are certain, I mean, just to talk about, I'm not, I'm not bumping the issue out here, but uh, just to sidetrack on that, there is, for instance, a particular drawing uh, which is a favourite of mine um, and which was bought by a guy in Berlin who, who's, who rose in my estimation immediately, not because he just bought the drawing, he could have bought several others that his choice was a very eccentric one, like hardly anybody else likes that drawing. It is technically unsuccessful. It attempts to take an axonometric projection, but sort of sideways on, so that all the planes in the drawing get muddled up. Uh, it was one I had a lot of trouble with and kept changing bits of it. It's still not successful. The objects are a bit strange. One could sit down and do a much better version. But it happens for me, to have a lot of ideas in it. It's got more ideas on it than that one that one of you like, which is the crisscross one. It's got a couple of ideas in it. I would claim that this other drawing has got, you know, ten times the number of ideas, but it's not as succinct as an image, it's not as prettily drawn, etc., etc. And I'm sure there's, coming back then to the issue of the, the, um, built object. I mean, the, the, uh, if I can mention somebody else sitting here, there are some of the buildings that, that you've done, that you and Peter have done, which I think are, are really fascinate me as conversations. I don't personally think that some of the bits are as, as I, you know, look as pretty as, as hardware, as they might, uh, okay, that might just be my opinion, but they're still more important buildings than a lot where the, the hardware really works and every chosen material, every trick. I mean, like a lot of American buildings, uh, like <laughs> mirror glass American buildings, I think are fantastic as commodities. I think they've really got it to the tea. I think they do it brilliantly. I mean, you look at that thing on the corner of Euston Road and you say, my God, you can tell this wasn't done by American. It's so fall about. Yeah, I don't think anybody from uh, what are they called? Brenton. Brenton is sitting here this evening. But you can just tell it's done by a, a culture that doesn't have, is still sort of you know, sort of got it it's slightly clanky. But I'm no technologist, but I just know that it's so. And you can go to some hick bit of North Carolina and see them do it like a dream. Now that's one thing. Intellectually, I don't find the you know, superb North Carolina version particularly interesting. If one wanted to do it, one would try and crib their details. When, when you talk there about, you see, about the glint on the hill, that the English react against the English, there is this cultural thing which is this extraordinarily strong. I remember once just showing slides of the lecture um, and not intending to be unkind, just following the whole theme of the lead lay academics, actually, in the sense of architects. And putting on it here, and they were talking about Chicago School, the whole medical problem, and, and, and its influence by various ways in Europe, and just ending with the, the, the two slides, one of, 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 of Seagram, which is some years ago now, and, and of, of the SAS building in Copenhagen. And it made everybody laugh, because, of course, the injection of the, uh, of the superficial in, interpretation of that whole um, base, industrial base, which gave rise to that entire architectural tradition, was utterly lacking in, in, in Denmark, which of course, from generations ago, he watered a house from the person down the road. And, and, and it, its superimposition, I think, on, on the absence of later architecture was very sad, as compared to his earlier architecture. And certainly Lane could see that immediately, and it has got to do with, things, with the whole tradition within the country itself, which I think one bucks one's danger at great risk, because you are of it. Yes, I think I, I've become more self-conscious about Englishness, and the debate with oneself about one's Englishness, the more I've been exposed to, to foreign places, you know, and spend now, in fact, a high proportion of my close personal friends are not English, an increasing number. And increasing the amount of one's time spent. So you recognise that. And one can never, you, you see, well, you become a walking Englishman. I mean, what I have to sort of sit on my sit on my hand not to do is, if I give six lectures during my period in Oslo, not to do the inevitable one, which is about sort of English architecture or what 
you know, what English culture means to this sort of material. I mean, I have resisted it just about what everybody expects to do. Because you start being a sort of self con I mean, I'm increasingly self-conscious, not only about one's Englishness, but about one's, you know, you can make nice packages, one's English provincial seaside background. You know, I, I, the one who used to use the seaside as, as, as an apo apology for Plug-in City, to say that, you know, Plug-in was really just carrying on the seaside tradition into a larger scale, which you, you can make an argument for it being. Uh, or you can say, you know, the East Anglian thing, or the London, I don't, I don't know, I, I am, I am, I am irritated by England the more I go outside it, and I love it dearly and realise how English I am. I think I'm more English in one's train of thought than my attachment to its buildings. That, that does strike me. Isn't one of the great traits of Englishmen to be irritated by themselves? Uh, I'm irritated by some of the artefacts. I, 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 I think but the ideas yeah. that run behind so, them are superb and should have led to fantastic... By mirroring themselves, that's how I used to put that. I mean, in particular, their artefacts, yes. Um, Which is, and coming back to what you started with, the fact, the, the, the almost assault in your drawings on much that you find it difficult not to accept. Probably. I mean, there is that thing of sort of Macintosh being appreciated in Darmstadt. And then probably being lived out in this, you know, places such as this weird little town, and obviously a sort of alcoholic who had to go and paint in France. I mean, not one intends to do that, but that, the, the, but he was Scottish anyway. I mean, that amuses me to think of it. the one person over fair, fairly wide. I mean, I find the arts and crafts thing, despite uh, the reinterest in it, that just isn't the same as you can steal. It just is something else. And it has that English sort of hairy, quiet, just inoffensiveness about it, which irritates. But then I digress. I must say I have inspired all the serious contributions to the discussion. I think what I really surprised the most about the previous terms is Leonardo highly enjoyable and he seems to be having a tremendous fun and doing that. I think that is a sort of splendid sense of observation. And I don't really think that one can take it for you. I don't really agree with most of the things which you say about your drawings. And I was just was thinking what I would think if I couldn't hear you talking about them. And I don't think that it would be at all anything similar to what you actually try to, you know, to explain. But you know, it doesn't really diminish the fact that your drawings are to me a tremendous source of imagination. Um, what about the new one, even with the Nordic well, colouring? Well, I was, <laughs> I, was I, was slightly slightly <laughs> that, no, I don't know who said it, but you know, somebody said that you know, architecture is you know, of, of the time. And I was just thinking that even at your drawings, which I didn't really expect, but you, know, you, could, you couldn't really make a mistake when placing them in uh, the right place. Uh, Order. I mean, you couldn't say in the drawing, the last one which you finished with was made, let's say, the four or five years ago. You couldn't? No. I hope not. No. <laughs> no, I was just thinking there that the sort of cheerful thing is sometimes associated with. It's not, with it's the not so cheerful. I don't know how it's due to the thing. We are always getting all on, but it's due to the fact that all the new buildings somehow just. Somehow, um, really resolve a little bit of postmodernism. So I hate that expression. Of, somehow, it, it isn't really. In Norway, incidentally, I'm, I'm regarded as a cover for the for the uh, closet postmodernism. <laughs> 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 Do you feel that you're going in any particular direction? I mean, can you feel what the way it's going to go? Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why why, why so didn't you see the solar house in this presentation here? Sorry? Why didn't we see drawings of the solar house? Oh, it's in the current area. No, it didn't actually fit the... Con I, want, I, I, restrict, I tried to restrict the conversation. I mean, I probably didn't, but, but the conversation was about... Uh, 
card diagrams and the point mm. of departure. This is a logical progression towards real yeah. buildings. Now there are real buildings yeah. happening. I mean, yeah. They have happened. They have been built. There are more to be built. Mm. Mm. Nice or maybe you'll ask me again in 10 years' time. When it's built, you can say, there you are. You didn't know about staining, did you? Well, you, know, you, you know, the, the irony, the irony, <coughs> the blue house is our, our, our first Soho House client, is, is uh, the local successful painting contractor. Um, and he is being extremely pernickety about the external finish because he knows about big things. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that there will be various hilarities that, 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 I mean, the thing I'm waiting for, of course, is for everybody to say, ah, yes, I bet it'll also be you know, <laughs> crash and a thing won't work. Uh, I suppose, like all such people, one ends up having lots of people holding in your hand, you know. Like, you sort of frank, maybe up to the <coughs> arms and side. In your early, in some of the early ones you showed this evening, you should the buildings were sort of very dynamic, but, and they were constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, well, they the, the matrix of armature, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. stayed the same, but the thing mm -hmm. sort of changed over the mm -hmm. course of time. Do you do you think of um, your real buildings as being like that, and do you think they will actually be able to change in a, in a dynamic way that you showed? Um, would, you, do you, would you like them to be able to do that? It's this terrible, terrible thing of, of an idea getting worked out of your system before you have done it, or when somebody else has done it. Like, there was this extraordinary experience of seeing the, the uh, Kikataki, I think it's, is it Kikataki Tower? Yeah. Uh, Osaka. Um, admittedly after the expo, when I first met the about four years ago, the tower was still up. And one was being driven past it, you know. And I think if I stopped to worry about it, I, I could have been very sad because I always thought that it was a lift off the Montreal Tower anyway. And you know, there he goes and builds the thing. Uh, in fact, it just looked like a sort of funny, slightly sad object on the top of the hill. And I wasn't sort of emotionally intrigued by it. And also, mm -hmm. I had that feeling of having seen so many photographs of it that it was like the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, there is and, and the same thing with seeing some of uh, Kurokawa's things as built, you know, partly, I suppose, the, the thing is saying, we, you know, you got the idea wrong or oversimplified it, which is a sort of easy art. But, but it's curious how unemotional one is about certain ideas once they've passed through your system. Mm. And I suppose that, they, that the problem with what, I mean, you know, hearing Ron talking about, say, the number of years that the South Bank took to build, or the number of years that the lot of them took to build, is, is whether the idea is intellectually passed through your system before the actual thing well, do it. goes yeah. up. Yeah, and so I just don't, I think it would be, I have another hunch there, I think we are going to get another period of, of uh, healthy interest in mechanisms. I think that we're out of the, what I call the brown rice pit. When you say we, do you mean you, you as, as an architect? Uh, no, I think a lot of other people. I think a lot of other people in the young architects in this city, and so you keep, you know, not me, but young architects in this city. I think any minute uh, we're going to see uh, a resurgence of interest in, uh, let's call it mechanistic architecture for, for the moment. Um, it won't be the same as the Sixties model, but it, 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 all the signs are here. I really, it might um, be allied can to... Can I just say yeah, sorry, something I'm trying to get in, but what? I really enjoy Peter's... Uh, oh, let me have blue roofs again. I just, really I'd really just like to say, I've really, you know, having been a student of Peter's as well, and uh, oh. I've really enjoyed your, you know, your sort of professionalism in a way. And it doesn't surprise me that you're interested in stimulated by Japan, Germany, Norway, you know, Austria. Those are, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's nice to see such a professional um, presentation, concerned with uh, very fine imagery. And I'm interested to ask you, when, with your imagery, do you have a sort of um, pet images of your own, which aren't, aren't your own, but at home do you have sort of 
um, treasures that you wouldn't like to tell us about, but things that you stimulate you, um, that not, not architecture, but, but other sources that you find uh, of interest. But essentially, I wanted to say that the professionalism, the international professionalism, the desire to be international, the desire to be professional internationally, is, uh, I find, extremely um, um, impressive. And I, you know, I think it's something that we, in England, we're all we're sort of so much, uh, so much of the architectural profession tries to sort of imitate, uh, um, you know, the amateur tries to be the amateur doing something. It's very nice to see somebody who's quite, quite polished and professional about everything he does, including teaching. And you know, and so but can you tell me about your? Uh, Personal interest in images at home. Yes, it's, it's very sweet that you said what you said because I always regard myself as a sort of dabbler in the public in the tradition. I mean, I spent vast periods of my time. I mean, the only thing that really one has sort of built in some quantity of sort of ex ex exhibitions or exhibits, and they've always been done on a sort of absurdly low budget. Uh, with, with ridic <laughs> under ridiculous circumstances, such as sort of strikes or you know not getting the wood or not usually not having the money, and so what can you do with cardboard box and a hundred quid kind of level? I, I regard myself as an expert on how to produce a magazine, you know, by using somebody's offset lifo machine with a sort of cheap plate and sure. all of this bit. Um, mm. It's nice to be called professional, uh, which. I think, that's I think you invent what, what you do is to invent a profession out of bits and bobs, which is a very interesting thing to do. But um, the other bit of the question is images at home and things, source material. I think. I mean, you I, tend to show us things that were that happened after your drawings. I, you know. I don't. I, I don't have that thing. What your, yeah. what your sources are a bit more. I know it means I everything. Think your, it's, I think it's. I think it's. A bit, but. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I, my favourite hobby of outside architecture. <clears throat> I think is gossip. <laughs> and I don't mean that. I don't mean that uh, flippantly. I mean, I'd like the 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 the, the cartoons that, that accompany the the Arcadia thing. I mean. I, I haven't done that before or since on any other project, but I, sorry, I mean, we spend an enormous amount of time, for instance, gossiping about our one uh, German client. Yeah. Fortunately, the last meeting we had down there happened to be his wife's birthday, right, at which a lot of people were in, local people were invited. That's absolutely, I mean, it's a mine of material. Peter, you're evading the question. I'm not evading the question. <laughs> I don't yes, have a collection of, I don't have a collection of uh, artifacts. I don't collect old toys or porcelain, do I? I mean, you, um, or pebbles or nice old bits of wood or I don't I, I don't like science fiction. It's quite obvious you don't like those things. But I, 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 I buy a lot of magazines. Yes. I mean Vogue I, and Tatler and things like that or what? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you name it. I'll buy it. It's really magazines. Magazines, I think, are the only thing yeah. you can <coughs> And, there's a, and, and, and I'm rather tightly architect. I think my image preference is a rather tight, rather more narrowly architectural than you would expect. I mean, I buy architectural books. Uh, I even on airplanes tend to read. Oh, read. You know, I don't have there's not a lot of external visual stimulus actually, but I'm fascinated by. People and, and you don't collect stamps. For no, nothing like that. I can't think of. I mean, those of you that know, can you comment? Yes. Don't. No, I'm not. I'm. You know, like a lot of really good architects, you find have a collection of I don't know Victorian paperweights, or bits of glass, or I don't know what they collect. I mean, what do you collect here? Yeah, what's it? Aeroplane propellers. I ain't got one. <laughs> 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 no, it, I, I, I think less so than a lot of our kids. The curious irony is that sort of, you know, not building, but actually collecting a lot of material about buildings. In schools. No, I, I think no, one of um, um, oh, yes, 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 the fondness for magazines has some mm. significance. Yeah. 
Uh, and the consumer interest in music. I mean, I use, I, I only can draw if there's some hullabaloo going on. I'm conversation. What sort of music? music. Uh, no. I draw best of Brahms. I've moved. <laughs> I, this, I draw. That occurs the tweed point blocks. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 and I then moved to another town where I happened to be the, the, the local symphony orchestra, and one got it on the chair. I'm sorry, that may be very funny, but absolutely straight from the cuff. Um, it, it is so. I can draw better to Brahms than anything else. I will, under, <laughs> under pressure, draw to certain other composers. You know, I buy, I buy tape and records of other music, but they don't necessarily work so well. I think that's a good moment. To, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 I, I must thank you. I mean, it's amazing. We've been having a discussion for an hour and 20 minutes, which I don't think we've ever had before, uh, over a broad range of subjects. That's the teacher. Which <laughs> is curiosity, I think. Uh, and I'd like to uh, sort of thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We can now eat. Oh my god. That's <laughs> 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 <laughs>